waiting for uh, some plane to take off for land. Well, it's a minute after, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Pete, uh, do you have a slide for NoteWell? I can find one if we need one. <laughs> All right, well, we'll just remind everyone, since everybody on the list is an old timer, <laughs> um, that the NoteWell applies, and uh, uh, please uh, treat each other with... Uh, respect as we go through this process. Go ahead, Pete. So I posted a quick summary of points that were raised yesterday. Um, as I mentioned at the end of the session, this is more or less a continuation. We wanna make sure that folks who weren't at yesterday's session um, get a little up to speed on where we got to make sure that we haven't missed anything and that uh, people are on. Oh, and the uh, uh, the recording got posted three hours ago while I was still in bed. Well, that's good. Um, hopefully those of you in Europe who were awake for such posting might have gotten a chance to watch the, uh, the video, but <laughs> we as you saw, I went and posted uh, before the session yesterday the sort of list of questions. We honed in on a couple of uh, points that I think people were in relative agreement about. And what I'd like to do is go over a couple of those, see if anybody has strong different opinions or thought that I got the... Uh, the points wrong in some way that I didn't summarize correctly. And then to continue on and maybe get to the question of um, what if any uh, XML source changes are acceptable and how those will work. So what I think we came down to was that um, the general policy questions of which presentation formats exist, how they should be managed, should not be significantly limited by RSWG policy for an RPC function to decide. Um, however, the RSWG does want to say as a matter of policy that presentation format should remain stable even when tooling or XML source uh, changes and the particular level of stability we want to get an idea of. And if there is a change in tooling or XML source, 
we should do the re-rendering, but those don't necessarily need to be distributed. We want to do the re-rendering as a matter of testing, but we could continue to distribute the original versions of the presentation formats. <laughs> and we didn't get too far into the what XML source changes are acceptable um, or how they need to be marked or versioned or distributed. So, Paul, why don't you start us off? So greetings. Um, I think I started you off about 10 minutes ago uh, with a message to the list um, reiterating what both Martins had said. Um, if we want to go down the path that you just said, Pete, which is a change to the XML that doesn't affect the reader much or, you know, would only visually affect the reader, wouldn't do it, um, doesn't cause a re-rendering then we have to change 7995 to remove the fact that the PDF says it. Um, having said that, um, I want to, since I wasn't here yesterday, I want to um, suggest that the first part of what you said, which was that the group said, we probably you know, don't want to overly restrict the, the RPC. That sounds fine to me. But I also think we can help the RPC by giving them guidance on anything that we think about re-rendering, as long as it is just guidance where we end up trusting them. And I'm, I'm a bit concerned that what you said makes it sound like there is no intention to add guidance. Um, I, I, would like, I would like this group as a policy to suggest guidance. Oh, that seems reasonable. And when um, you, you dropped off before I could ask a question, but... Um, I, I did want to get a sense from you of um, does that distinction about re-rendering, re-rendering and testing versus re-rendering and distributing. Um, I just wanted to find out. Oh, it has to be distributed. Re that is. I just want to make sure I understood what you were referring yeah, to. Yeah. So, so if it, according to 7995, um, as, as my reading of it, I mean, Jay may disagree, but. Um, if that if, if I get the XML and I get the PDF, the XML that is embedded in the PDF, if it doesn't match the XML that I just got off of the of, off of the RFC editor's website, I would consider that an error. Interesting. Okay, thanks. That helps. Um, Jay, you're up to bat. So yeah, yeah, I do agree with Paul on that last part. The the bit that I, the, it, I sent this in a message to RSWG. We can actually take an existing PDF file and replace the XML that is embedded in it without regenerating the visual representation part of it. Okay. Um, the the bit that I'm concerned about is how we verify a mass regeneration of visual representations. And that's the bit that I'm trying to, you know, reduce to where we have to do it. John, go ahead. Oh, and while you're joining, I, I will mention that um, uh, uh -huh. Robert reminded us today that uh, using the local mute button, if you plan to speak multiple times, the one in the lower right corner is much faster than uh, turning on and turning off the, the big mute button. Yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I, I would suggest a slightly stronger criterion than the one it Applied, I think, by Jay's comments, which is that if that PDF starts changing, even bitwise in the ways which are invisible, um, we then start having problems with what's the authoritative copy because people are going to want to verify that the copy they used to have is or is not the same as, uh, as the one which they just got or might get. <clears throat> And the only way to do that ultimately, or the only straightforward way to do that ultimately, and that gets 
back to both Jay's and Paul's point, is to a bitwise comparison of the two files. And if we start saying, well, the visual representation hasn't changed, or the visual representation hasn't changed very much, uh, but the XML has changed, then the bitwise compares don't work. And the problem which Brian Carpenter has raised multiple times about making certain everything we do, which is different in any way, is properly documented and dated, starts entering the problem. Yeah, and I, I think that does lead us to that bigger question of um, how to mark version um, the presentation formats as they go out so that people know what they're getting. And how to mark the XML when it's modified, however it is modified, so that people know what the micro version of that is, regardless of whether it affects presentation changes or not. My, my problem with this all along is that I find it very hard to separate this set of issues into nice categories and uh, and therefore discuss them separately and that and at the same time i recognize the problem you have which is if we don't break them out into separate categories and try to analyze them separately we will make no progress at all so i, I think there's a contrast in a dilemma there yeah I, I and i think as came up on the call uh yesterday um you know my my purpose in putting out the thought experiment and the you know uh, uh setting the the ridiculous ends of the discussion um was to sort of spark the discussion and get us to hone in on what we really intend um elliot you're up uh, good morning good afternoon uh to people good evening to anybody who is uh, uh well east of me um i was i just want to say two things first um i think the uh identification of new versions was actually solved, um, I want to say the 1800s, but maybe in the 1700s with uh, printing numbers. And it's something that we could use. I, I don't think this is a, a challenge that is beyond our grasp. Um, but it to me clear where the line is between a reprint and an addition uh, to make sure that there's, you know, no, uh, you know, and I think that line is pretty clear to everybody on this call, by the way. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, I think we had a good discussion yesterday, and I think, Jay, you, you, you really summarized things very well, uh, even today, um, in terms of, uh, you know, when we, when we need to do reprints. I did not know that you could substitute in the XML uh, in an existing document. That's 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 very interesting. The second point I wanted to make, um, and this is, I just want to lay down a marker, which is we're spending a lot of time worrying about the existing uh, document series, right? I would like us to spend a little bit more time on the future um, in terms of what we where, where we want not not just changing the existing documents, but what we want the future documents to look like. Right. If, if if we were to separate those out and handle them as two different problems, right? It could be that they unite and combine nicely later, but I feel like we're holding ourselves back by worrying about the the existing by worrying about changes to the existing series and and not focusing as well as we could be on say what the future series looks like. And I realize that's a very vague statement, uh, a very open statement. Um, but a, a, it's a caution, right? We can, we, we, this group, people who are on this call, uh, like to trip ourselves up um, in, in terms of process. So we might be able to untrip ourselves up a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff. You know, I, I love the discussion about math and ML, for instance. I think it's a great thing that we should be thinking about. Uh, incorporation of uh, other, uh, other data forms in the source form, what it looks like in the rendered form, what it means in the intermediate form. I think these are all important points, and I don't want them to be lost sight of as we try and think about the existing series. So thanks very much, everyone. I'll say, Elliot, that, you know, um, part of the reason I wrote up my thought experiments the way I did and, and sent out that message was my sense of the discussion was those future-looking things are 
interesting but relatively easy compared with the backward looking stuff um that we seem to be hung up on them and i sort of wanted to clear them off uh clear those issues first um because i think the whether to use math ml i, I think it's going to be a controversial and interesting discussion but i don't think it's going to be hard the way this one has been yeah yeah and just to follow up right um sometimes uh, let, let me restate what you just said in 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 more succinct terms let's go for the low-hanging fruit where we can i think it'd be nice to notch some wins yeah appreciate it so i'm not hearing screams of a pete you got the whole summary of yesterday wrong or b um uh i wasn't here yesterday and you people were idiots uh paul do you want to uh make that uh, claim <laughs> yeah well i i thought you had more to say you only did the first bullet point so i thought you were going to go through them all and then i was going to bring stuff up no ju jump in anytime you like on any of those okay um then consider me jumped here um I wasn't on the call yesterday, so I didn't hear the flow of things, but I've been following the list fairly carefully. Um, I'm having some cognitive dissonance with the idea that we should be keeping the, um, we, we should not be republishing the derived formats very often. Like Jay just suggested, even if we've regenerated, if, even if we've changed the XML, maybe we just jam the new XML into the old re-rendering. Going back to what I said earlier, I think it would be good if we could help the RPC decide. And I think the rule would be, we have a zillion different kinds of readers of RFCs, but here are the ones we care about the most. Uh, and, I'm sorry, and those readers will have different desires for do you regenerate or not. Clearly, there are, you know, one set of readers is people who said, well, you never used to regenerate, you know, when it was text only, therefore, I want that old world. And then there's another set of readers who say, when I go to, to the RFC editor site and I look at something, I would like it to be maximally useful to me, regardless of what the history is. Um, I think, personally, from my recent experience, the two most important set of readers of RFCs are implementers and people who are writing um, RFCs that are related to the RFC that they're reading. In both of those cases, I would believe that they could care less if the HTML looked a slightly different than it did a week ago, as long as the text had not changed. And to me, that says, regeneration is just fine as long as it is consistent as long as when i go to the rfc editor's site and i get whichever format i care about that if i'd gotten a different one it would have been consistent um both of those groups will care somewhat about the history of the rendering but only a little bit so if that information is there you know and is retrievable by them and maybe they even want to retrieve an old version. Like if they look at the version information and say, oh, wait, I think I was reading this six months ago. And it says that that, that somehow it's been re-rendered in the last six months. Um, they may want to go back and look. And probably the only reason they would want to do that is to look at a diff. Um, but those people, and again, I, I, I truly don't care about librarians here. I truly don't care about lawyers and such like that. They're all valid readers, but, but if we focus on them, we are not serving the readers we care about the most. So my view is tell the RPC, do what you want. And if they want to, in order to keep things consistent, re-render that you know that's just fine again this is all preceding any actual change in the text that would affect the reader cool rich you are up
Whoop. And Rich, you are not making noises. Oh, so now I have two mute buttons. I have to. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is clarifying for Paul. I think I heard him say we care about you know two communities use two community abusers, those writing RFCs and those writing. And I wasn't sure what he said if he meant, you know, if he meant derived works, modification works, or implementations. Implementation. But, okay, so you didn't, you aren't intending to refer to just the people within the IETF community. No, 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 no. Okay, absolutely thanks. not. That that was, and then I put those first. By the way, they are yeah, actually even more important than us because we know our rules and they don't. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. I agree with that. John, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to make a case for uh, for librarians and uh, and more important for product managers and marketing people and their lawyer friends, uh, <clears throat> uh, which is that for both of those groups, <clears throat> um, um, absolute stability and predictability is important. Uh, being able to understand exactly what uh, changes have been made and why is important. Uh, and uh, and having things change out from under them in ways which could, in somebody's perception, even a extremely creative and hostile leader of the RFCs, uh, pull the ground out from under them when they are shipping products, making promises about products, making promises about conformance, and a variety of other things are really important. And while we don't see that on a day to day basis in the IETF, it ultimately affects contributions, it ultimately affects our liability to lawsuits, uh, and it <clears throat> and it affects the indirect liability of companies promoting products based on our standards to continue to do that, all of which are probably important. Uh, can I rank those above or below the ones that Paul cited? Um, I don't know, but I don't know it's a useful effort. Paul? On to, to respond to John, no, it's not useful. We have to have a priority. And to me, the priority is the two groups that I said above. Those are people who would want to see something that matches what they thought was what the IETF decided. Again, we are only talking at this point about possible visual changes, such as line rewrapping, page breaks, and so on. Once we start talking about actual changes to the text, such as indications that this RFC has been updated later by that one, or that this RFC has errata in it that has been agreed to, those, those will very much affect the groups you're talking about, and therefore we need to um, consider them. But those affect the readers themselves as well and I would still prioritize those. If we prioritize at all the groups you just talked about, John, then we should have never even gone to XML. We should have stuck with the old text format. When we went to the XML, we purposely said, we know that the people who want absolute stability are gonna be hurt by this, but we believe that the IETF community and the developer community will be helped. And Paul, we're we're in <clears throat> we're in ninety percent agreement about that. Uh, and what's in the other ten percent is questions about whether, based on retrospect and experience and thinking about things, that XML decision was the right one or the wrong one. And uh, and that's uh, and and that's where again I will defer to some of Brian's comments. Uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, if and this group also, wants to make a policy to stop doing XML, we have the ability to do that. And yes, <clears throat> and and I would agree with you 100% about what you said and about those priorities. 
the moment we decide we are not in standards business, but merely in the implementation specification business for people who are interested in understanding our specifications and following them. Go ahead, Jake. Thanks, Pete. Um, as I understand it, nobody has argued against us having a very robust and very transparent um, uh, record of all of the changes that are made as part of any form of um, regeneration republication process. Um, and I wonder if it's possible for us to sort of um, put a um, stake in the ground for that one and say that we're all agreed that that has to be there, that's a prerequisite. And if we did do that, how much that might address any concerns that um, John has just expressed. You broke up at the end of that sentence. Could you try again? Sorry, I was just saying that if we could all, agree, if we could agree, that we had a that that there will must be a robust and very transparent um, change um, uh, change system here that everyone can see. Then would that address many of the concerns that John has there? Got it. But, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Paul, I fully agree with with what Jay just said. I think that that would alleviate the concerns. Um, I think again we can do this not as policy of how things are done, but recommendations to the RPC um, saying that these are our, our, our most important users of the RFC series. They will have some things that they want. And I believe what Jay just said, while not being foremost in their mind as much as it would be for like when we bring up, oh, lawyers and stuff, but it is something that a developer would want because Many of them, like, for example, if I'm developing a DNS tool and I need to look up something about TCP again, God damn it, I will look it up and then I will look it up again six months later. It would be nice if I could see that, oh, well, since I looked at this last, did anything happen? So I think that that is a perfectly reasonable thing for that user to say there should be a way for them to do that. Yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> um, let me try to draw a distinction, which I have been sort of circling around. Um, if we are in the specification business for implementers, one group of people are interested in a particular thing and how to do it and sharing that with other people who might be interested in implementing it. <clears throat> we have a different set of constraints and objectives and maybe most important audiences, although it's questionable how you define that, than we do if we claim we're in the standards business. As soon as we're in the standards business, we start talking about conformance or the lack thereof and Fine points of intellectual property rights is distinct from broader issues having to do with who can implement what. Uh, we are in a slightly different business and it changed the discussions. And I'm at the stage where if the IETF were to decide that the decision to go into the standards business company years ago was probably a mistake and we should be back in the implementation specification and discussion business, I would lose very little sleep over that. But it's not a decision the community has made. We continue to talk about ourselves as a standards body. We continue to stand up in various places and say standards body. We continue to proclaim that our stuff are standards. And as soon as you do that, you bring in all of these other issues. Again, um, for fine details, the implementers are the primary audience. I agree with Paul. Uh, for 
evolving those implementation specifications. Authors are a prime audience, and I agree with Paul. But to dismiss the others or claim they're secondary doesn't work for me as long as we claim to be in the standards business. Interesting. I'm trying to get my head around how we as a community might move that needle. Um, Paul, go ahead. As, as much as I hate to tell the working group chairs what they should do, um, I believe what John just said is wholly outside of our charter. If later the IETF charter changes in some way, then great, then we can come back and revisit. But our charter is to deal with what we've got in front of us um, for RFCs, for readers of RFCs, for mechanisms for making RFCs. And um, I believe that the last six weeks worth of discussion on the mailing list shows absolutely that different types of readers have different desires for stability of different things, stability of the XML, stability of the rendered XML and such like that. I mean, that's been super, super clear on the mailing list. Now, mind you, much of the mailing list was saying, I'm talking about what other people want, not me. We don't have a whole bunch of developers on the mailing list, you know, people who are implementers saying this is exactly what I want, but it wouldn't even matter if we did because that small number of people who happen to be on our mailing list absolutely will not be represented and we don't know in which way. So we have to make a guess, but I would say we should make a guess within our charter and our charter is not about deciding is the IETF standards body and what that means. Our charter is to take the current world and try to reflect it as um, best as we can in the RFC series. Go ahead, John. I, 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 I am in complete agreement with Paul about the scope problem. <clears throat> but I think until and unless the IETF in some fashion uh, chooses to uh, change its scope and decide we are or not, decide we are not in the standards business rather than being in standards business, then we are stuck, as, this working group is stuck with the fact the IETF is in the standards business. And indeed, uh, making decisions which are incompatible with being in the standards business are taking us out of scope and contradicting what is generally considered to be the IETF consensus and as well as that scope problem. And again, we need to be reminded that this working group is neither all of the audience for RFCs nor representative of the IETF. It's the people who have decided that it's a good use of their time to spend time worrying about these, set, these sets of details and policies in the RFC series. But we can't say that as a consequence of that, either our charter or the composition of the working group, that the rest of the world goes away. And that's the reason why the standards issue is important. Not, not, um, not as a choice we could make the change, but as a constraint. I'll say from a, you know, from the perspective of me um, as chair, there is an expectation in this working group, and I, I presume that uh, even though he's not on the present call and uh, uh, Lars or his predecessor will eventually pipe up. Um, there is an expectation that the stream heads and assorted others from each stream will participate and express the needs, desires of each of the streams. So I would expect if we made some sort of statement along the lines of we think that the order of priority for who we are going to serve is x y and z 
that the IETF stream head might come back and say, whoa, uh, not quite, or might come back and say, sounds like a good plan to me. So I agree with you, we cannot change the status of what the IETF wants out of us, but we can certainly listen to responses if we think as a matter of policy, we think this is the best way to lean, um, prioritize readers over um, assorted other folks. John, go ahead and then Pete. Elliot. Pete, I think that's right, uh, except that we need to keep in mind um, for, uh, for better or worse, that the IHF chair does not represent IHF consensus without some actions that the ISG speaking as a group does not represent ITF consensus without some actions. The other streams are each different in other ways. But, uh, but again, we need to be careful there and we need to be, be responsible to those communities, even if making changes for them is, is well outside our charter. Yep, agreed. Um, I, you know, I do think the IETF chair and the IASG can say we believe this is the consensus of um, the IETF or has been um, expressed that and um, you know the, the community can always say you got that wrong but yes I, in general I agree with what you say. Elliot you're up. Right -o. so um... I'll just comment. I'm here. The, the primary reason I'm here is because I hold the position of the independent submissions editor. And the way I read the the, the enabling document, I really have to be here. Um, so uh, that's why I'm here. Um, and I hope everybody agrees that I'm participating, perhaps even a bit too much. So, uh, but I with the, the and and by the way, I. I I want to comment that I'm not passing judgment on uh, the IAB or the IETF uh, chair on this. They all have their own priorities, and while they, they and they may read the document differently, as they may want to see uh, fixed proposals before they pass judgment, um, and that may just be the, the the most efficient use of their time. So I'm not uh, I'm not passing judgment on them. I'm just saying how I read things and and how I'm using my time. And for the record, uh, um, uh, Miria is on holiday this week um, and let us know ahead of time that there wasn't going to be a good day that she could make it in, in this week or next. I'm looking at the list. Have we settled in? People comfortable where we are? Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so proposed next step is, Pete, that you write up what you've heard today, send it to the list, um, and that Martin uh, Thompson revises his draft and that the working group uh, figures out whether that's right, and if so, either adopts it, melds it into mine, mine melds into his or whatever, and um, then I would say a next step is for at least for me to propose some wording for whatever the document is of what we want to say to the RPC about um, priorities so that, uh, you know, at, so that they can um, make choices on, on the rendering and re-rendering themselves. So take what Martin has, add some to it, add, add something to it after the next version of um, uh, suggestions to the RPC and then figure out how to turn that into a working group document or not, however that goes. That's my proposal. Jay? Thanks. Um, it, yeah, um, I I'm still don't think we're operating at high enough a level in terms of our um, understanding of the requirements here. I think we're getting better because we started talking about the end users of things. Um, but we're still a way off, I think, um, where we should be. Um, we, the, the RFC series has a, um, a brand, a reputation 
it has a um, uh, a usage it has a um, you know an impact and I think that those are the that's the level at which we ought to be considering the guidance that we provide around this um, and we ought to particularly be focusing on the risk from things um, if for example we were to um, inadvertently re-render 3000 PDFs so that they were black text on a black background and we weren't to spot that or something, you know. Um, these th That's the position I think we ought to be starting from. We, we, we're still, I think, looking at the mechanical level of guidance rather than that big picture about the, the series. The, the, the reason I say this is because the decision to make it immutable it, it, immutable you know that was made some time ago has in you know has created a particular brand has created a particular um set of um high level um understandings about it and w we can't ignore that we need to think from that same level as to about the changes that we're going to make thanks john You appear to be muted, John. <laughs> Too many buttons. I, I'm, uh, I'm finding myself in complete agreement with Jay's comment. And, uh, and I don't know, unlike Paul's comment, how much further we can get with the documents without opening up the can of worms about what substance changes are or are not permitted, where something that is loosely defined as changes what the rendered output looks like whether in the direction of jay's extreme example about black text on black backgrounds or whether changes in the direction of what some people might consider grammatical errors and other people consider substantive or changes which we might believe are corrections to substantive errors in the original that uh, that need to be fixed and there is probably some sort of spectrum there or maybe there are orthogonal but until we open address that can of worms i don't know i don't see how to make significantly more progress forward although new drafts would, might certainly help Yeah, I'm. I, I've been trying to understand Jay's point a little deeper. Um, because, well, go ahead, Michael. I, I guess I don't really understand John's issue, um, but maybe I can re-explain and he can say yes or no. Um, is he asking what is the division line between um, uh, 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 less uh, edits and errata? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so for all the things that you talked about grammar and this and what might be a grammar change and whatnot, those all fall into errata today. If you want, if you th come up with a grammar mistypo, then you file an editorial errata, right? Well, uh, yes, but the first problem is that I have deep concerns about the errata system. And okay, but that's not our purview. So, so, so if you moment. assume you, yeah. I have deep concerns about the errata system and its classification model. So that's one. So, so that's actually the case that one person's grammatical error could turn out to be somebody else's substantive change, and I'm worried about the substantive changes. But uh, those are and, all errata. Do you agree? Those are all errata. Just you just have a problem I, with I, which I, category I, it is. I believe they are all filed as errata. But to the extent to which one of the changes we make to the rendered RFCs 
is to reflect those errata and the decisions about them, then regardless of whether they started out as errata or they started out somewhere else, they are changes to the rendered RFCs. And I haven't been talking about errata on this call precisely because I have been talking about the issue of changes or not to deliver RFCs, which is slightly different from changes to, which is a, is, is a superset perhaps of changes to render RFCs. And okay, so let, let me do a chair interrupt here because everything on my sort of thought experiment questions list, I believe was either changes to the rendering engine, which might produce different output, or changes to the XML source, which might produce different output. Um, and things like errata, I agree with both of you, are a very separate category of changes to the presentation that we have to deal with at some point. Um, and we may decide to punt it by way of dealing with it or insist that the errata system gets changed in some significant way to deal with it. But those issues about presentation changes, I think I agree with you, John, they're a much bigger can of worms. Um, and I'm inclined to leave that can closed until we sort the rest of this. Um, Paul. It will go further than your gentle decline. I would say we cannot look at that until we have looked at this. And therefore, I disagree with John's proposal that we talk about it more before looking at drafts. I think that this group is not a good discussion group without text in front of it, that we end up wandering much further into solution space. Um, I, I, and I would love it if every time someone says errata or, you know, was updated by that the chairs just slam it down for now because we know we're going to deal with that in the future. It's not a question of if, it is definitely a question of when. But the when should be in the future after we have done something here and have given ourselves a few months of seeing published RFCs under whatever we just changed. Then we will have a feeling for how did that Thing that we just did change the RFC series, the perception of the RFC series and such like that, so that we can make a more informed decision about anything that changes the content. Um, we have a set of possible changes to the XML that we've been sitting on for almost a year now, or we've been sitting on for more than a year now. Um, those will change some rendering, whether it's rendered in the current, you know, we re-render or it'll change the rendering of, of other RFCs. We, sh you know, we're not in a rush on any of this. We should take steps. And, and Pete, I'm serious. I really would like y'all, you and Russ, to say we are not going to, to open the can of worms, period. We will not until we have experience with um, the, the outcome of what we're discussing now. John, go ahead. And, 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 and I would consider that completely reasonable and agree with it, <clears throat> except for at least my interpretation of the problem Jay mentioned, which is that in the process of experimenting with this and trying to do a series of incremental changes rather than making changes only when we understand where we're going, we're running some risk of messing up that brand. And part of that brand is also associated with my issues about standards versus implementation specifications and all the rest. But that's the that's the problem. Would I prefer to see us figure out a way to proceed incrementally on this? Absolutely, yes, for reasons which probably match Paul's, that certainly match 
general good sense for making progress. But this is a complicated system, and I don't understand how we say, okay, we're going to ignore all the rest of the system and go do, deal with these things and hope that that doesn't have ill effects, which causes a lot of trouble later or causes external difficulties, including that brand perception problem. I think, Russ, you're locally unmuted because I'm hearing clicky. <laughs> Jay, go ahead. Sorry, I'm taking the okay. note. Um, thanks, Pete. You said you didn't, you were still thinking through what my point. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples from um, uh, from my draft there. They're not to say the rest of the draft is in any way applicable, just pulling out a couple of bits. Okay. So one of them is about the frequency of change. Um, even if we had very good reason to change something frequently, would we want to change something frequently? Um, say, for example, the PDF. OK, um, because how would that drive a different behavior or expectation amongst the people that um, consume it? Um, my own view, by the way, is that this is perhaps driving us more and more to the HTML being the um, the expected authoritative red version of things because changes to that are are not noticeable in the same way as they are for a pdf if you know if we've got like version 764 of a pdf you know out there um just doesn't happen in the same way to that um the next thing is you know the 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 reasoning as to why we make the change now we've i agree with paul let's put aside the idea of um content changes you know aside okay but we do have the things that you described um you know the the change to the tools we have things like you know white lines we have uh, metadata you know the, the markup layout and those type of things um we, i think we need to set a principle about how often something changes for those or or what a threshold basically rather than perhaps a, a timing around those as well um you know um if if somebody if we all agree that um you know that, that we're all going to do what we i think we all think is a perfectly rational thing of have two spaces after a period instead of one space after a period are we going to go around and make any changes for that you know um for example that's the type of thing we need to do and then the um final thing here i think i've got in my list is you know is this question about um publishing something when there is nothing changes as well. Um, when we have, uh, uh, you know, either bit for bit identical change or we have no change to the visual content at all. Um, are we just going to confuse people by suggesting that we've changed something there and force people to look for it or, you know. So so those are the type of questions I think we just need to answer from, from that user perspective and try to put those in. They're just, you know, I mean, it's not meant to to stop it and i don't think it's particularly hard but it just changes that direction of thought to how how people consume rather than how we produce yeah and and i think and uh, you know russ and i have to go and write up the discussion from yesterday and, and today but i think i'm hearing general agreement on the answers to those questions being, yes, the changes should be at a slow pace, not at a fast pace. Um, but yeah, I, I, okay, that does help me um, that, that I agree we have to come up with those principles. We are five minutes from the top of the hour we are obviously not getting to the um, what XML source changes are reasonable, how they should be implemented, how they should be uh, put into old RFCs and such. Anybody have final thoughts on the rest? All right. So, whoop, John, what? that question, Pete. Um, 
do we want to tackle that XML changes topic at the next IETF, or do we want to do an interim, say, uh, three, four, five weeks from now? To that, that's that's. I would like to spend the few minutes we have left deciding whether we want to do that. Pete, now you're muted. Damn it. Um, yes, e either of the two of you, John or Paul, on, on the topic of do we want to dive into XML changes on the next, uh, on, on a, um, at the next IETF meeting, or should we have an interim in between? I, I, I think an interim would be worthwhile. Um, uh, and, and I also wanted to add something else that Jay mentioned, which we are not addressing either which is the question of whether we are changing the normative form or the, even the normative presentation form from, uh, from uh, looking at the PDF to looking at HTML. That's another whole can of worms which we haven't addressed. And I'm not taking a position on it, only pointing out that uh, it's something which we need to put in the queue somewhere. Mute it again, Pete. I can't keep my state. Um, so Robert points out the next IETF meeting is in one, two, three, four, oh, it's longer than four weeks, five, six weeks from now. Yeah. So um, yeah, we would have to have an interim right soon if we're going to do it. Paul? Um. I will strongly disagree with John that we should have another interim on that topic. I believe that we need to nail down a consensus view of how we want to deal with re-rendering and such before we actually go into what will happen that might cause a re-rendering. We know conceptually but there are some issues on that. I don't think we need to rush it. Um, and I would like us to stop discussing and actually writing stuff into drafts. I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive here. And I think trying no, I, to... And to I, like I, I'll, I'll say that... Week like that isn't a good idea. So I, I will say, Paul, given yesterday's discussion, um, and Russ and I have to write it up, I, I, the reason that I think it's actually plausible to do an interim on the XML topic is because I think it's plausible beforehand on the list to get the consensus you're talking about and starting to get things into drafts. Oh, great. Um, if so. But then again, yeah, I, I, I was being more out this... of, from a meeting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think it's plausible that we start honing in on that on the list in the next couple of weeks and that getting a stake in the ground on the XML thing in an interim might be plausibly useful. Um, or just do it on the list. Yeah, we, I think if we can start it on the list, I suspect, um, as with the topics we've been discussing, the presentation format topics, that, um, uh, you know, it, it's going to take a little voice to get that going, but uh, I'm certainly willing to give it a go. Okay, it looks like we lost Pete. Mine is showing he's offline. So. 
So, uh, John, you get the last word if uh, if that's a new hand. Otherwise, Pete and I have some homework. All right, we will send out some, uh, some notes and uh, follow up on the list. We're going to end right on time. Thank you all.